Pay close attention. What you're about to see is Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Welcome to YPN News, bringing you news as it relates to Bible prophecy and foretold by Yeshua Hawkins. Katan, several interesting events in the news this week, mainly with Syria. In fact, the U.S. rhetoric against the Syrian government rose to a threatening level this week after the slaying of two families took place near the town of Hama. The pictures of dead children, including several infants, have been posted all over the news. The rebels blame the Syrian army for the killings, but news sources have been unable to verify this information because they have been banned from the area. President Obama had this to say about the incident. It is absolutely imperative for the international community to rally and send a clear message to President Assad that it is time for a transition. It is time for that regime to move on, and it is time to stop the killing of Syrian citizens by their own government. Now, Secretary of State took a similar message with her to a remarkable meeting of 70 countries that got together in Tunisia to find a way to stop Assad. Secretary of State Clinton warned both Assad and his armed suppliers, including Russia, that the death and suffering of innocent people has to end now. Clinton went on to say if the Assad regime refuses to allow this life-saving aid to reach people in need, it will have even more blood on his hands. And so too will those nations that continue to protect and arm the regime. The secretary also said that Russia and China shared the blame for the violence by blocking a UN resolution that would have condemned Assad. Clinton said it is just despicable. And I ask, whose side are they on? They are clearly not on the side of the Syrian people. On the question of what happens if Assad refuses to budge, the Saudis were blunt. Asked if the rebels should be supplied with arms, Saudi Foreign Minister Saud al-Faisal said, Yes, I think it's an excellent idea. When asked why, he said, because they have to protect themselves. Now, the conference in Tunis was staged as a global show of outrage. There were new pledges of financial sanctions against the Syrian regime and a show of who might replace Bashar al-Assad. In what amounted to an international debut, the exile group Syria National Congress was invited to form a transitional government for the day Assad leaves. CBS News met with president of the SNC, Boran Galioun, who in his normal life is a professor of politics at the Sorbonne University in Paris. Now, this is a Catholic university there. CBS reporter Wyatt Andrews asked, Are you potentially the next president of Syria? Galioun responded, I am the first person to put themselves on the line representing the Syrian revolution until the regime falls. Now, with many allied against him, the conference ended on a demand that Assad allow in emergency food and medicine in the area immediately. Now, the rebels in Syria, they are up against a well-trained, well-armed military. The Syrian elite forces are led by the dictator's brother. CBS News' Clarissa Ward has been with the rebels twice recently, once in December and another time two weeks ago inside Syria. Clarissa reported for CBS on what the rebels have to fight back with. She reported that the group, which calls itself the Syrian Liberation Army, had a very modest selection of light weaponry, Kalashnikovs, rocket-propelled grenades, and some very crudely fashioned homemade bombs, but are desperate for more weapons. Their only funding comes from the Syrian diaspora, but because the supply is so limited and the demand is so high, the price of weapons has gone through the roof. They said a Kalashnikov, or an AK-47, which is the standard machine gun that is prevalent in that area, is about $2,500. Now that's roughly five times the world average. She went on to report that there are several ways the arms are getting into Syria. Some weapons are being confiscated from attacks on the Syrian army and they're being bought on the black market inside Syria itself. Others are being smuggled in from the bordering countries. 
Lastly, still on the topic of Syria, we also noticed this week is the anniversary of the Assad dictatorship. The current president's father took over Syria 41 years ago. More turmoil in Afghanistan as several copies of Islam's holiest book, the Quran, were burned on a U.S. military base. A spokesman for the International Command admitted that it was a mistake, but that didn't stop several mobs of Afghans from protesting the act committed by these allied forces. This incident is being labeled, of course, as a mistake, but the sight of a charred copy of Islam's holiest book is considered a terrible insult, according to a spokesman for the International Command. So, just what led up to these recent protests, you might ask? Well, the Koran and other religious materials were confiscated from the library at the American-run prison at Bagram Air Base because prisoners were allegedly using the materials to pass notes to each other. Then, according to CBS News, in an act of carelessness or stupidity, the materials along with the Korans were treated like ordinary trash and sent to a burn pit. Several Afghan workers quickly stopped the burning and were able to retrieve one of the singed Korans, setting off protests which quickly spread to other parts of the country. Now in Kabul, firemen and guards, they use water hoses and rubber bullets to beat back a mob outside NATO headquarters. In Jalalabad, crowds chanted, death to America, this despite an immediate and public apology run on Afghan television by the top U.S. commander, General John Allen. General Allen said in his public apology, it was a mistake. It was an error. The moment we found out about it, we immediately stopped and intervened. He also ordered an investigation to be made public as soon as possible in an effort to put an end to the violence. Now we go to our field correspondent, Larry McGee, who is reporting on the increasing number of Americans on food stamps. Larry, what do you have for us this week? Thanks, Jeff. Despite slight gains in the housing market, which some people are regarding as a positive indicator with respect to the economy, 12 million American citizens are currently unemployed, and the bulk of those citizens now find themselves in need of government assistance just to make ends meet. One such person, Mr. John Manton, a college graduate and unemployed legal career, interviewed for CBS News, never dreamed that at 64 years old, he'd have an empty freezer, be dependent on food stamps, and have to skip meals just to scrape by. Mr. Manton, who represents a growing number of people who are falling out of the so-called middle class and into poverty, spoke to CBS in tears as he communicated fears and concerns ranging from the possibility of losing his childhood home to the increase in the retirement age and whether or not political incompetence and callousness might soon raise the age for Medicare as well. Where is it all going to end, he asked. As heart-wrenching as Mr. Manton's story may be, it is neither singular nor uncommon and is indicative of a tumultuous system which has generated an increase of over 20 million Americans just since the recession of 2007 who now require government assistance just to eat. For YPN News, I'm Larry McGee. Gatan Jeff, back to you. Uh, thank you for that report there, Larry. From wars throughout the Middle East to the economy being affected throughout the entire world, continue to stay tuned as we watch Israel Hawkins explain these Bible prophecies that were actually foretold thousands of years ago. For YPN News, I'm Katan Alexander. And I'm Jeffrey Heimerman. Thanks for joining us.